Amen. Okay, so first order of business is I had to go to the scripture for this message today, and I was looking as hard as I could for um, a passage of scripture, just a big old meaty passage of scripture that would show us a family in the scripture, um, saints of old who had great families and were great parents, and we could read about them and learn how to parent like they did. And I couldn't find any. Any. Um, it doesn't exist. Um, Adam and Eve, the first people, rebelled against their father in heaven, refused his authority, declared themselves to be autonomous and independent of their heavenly father. Not a great example for us to follow. Then they had two kids. Do you remember them? Cain and Abel, the very first brothers, the very first sibling rivalry led to murder. We can't look at them. Abraham abandoned Hagar and her child Ishmael, his own flesh and blood, because of a rivalry between them and his wife, Sarah. Isaac and Rachel had twins, and they both had favorites amongst the twins that were different, and they sowed discord and hatred between their twins. That's all in Genesis. Jacob then had, tw uh, had favorites amongst his 12 sons, and Joseph was so much the favorite that the other brothers kidnapped him and sold him into slavery in Egypt. You might have heard about that story. Then Moses comes along to free God's people from Egypt it appears that he abandoned his wife Zipporah and his kids so that he could go and be on mission with God. He chose ministry over family. So Jethro, father-in-law, had to bring wife and the kids back and confront Moses and bring him back into the fold. David comes along and David has a son named Absalom who revolts and tries to steal the throne from his dad. So David has to have Absalom killed. And then Solomon comes along. And he doesn't just love the wife of his youth. He has hundreds of wives and goes into all kinds of idolatry. I, I could go on. But there's no good examples, guys. Um, so we can't look to the human parents in Scripture for our example. What we have to do is look at God the Father as the perfect parent of us. And once we, once we get a focus on that and we can learn from him, then we can bring the principles of his perfect parenting into our broken parenting. Amen? Okay. So Psalm 103, 13, let's start here. The Lord is like a father to his children. How is he like a father to his children? He is tender and he is compassionate to those who fear him. God is gentle. God is tender in his love toward us. And not only does he loves it, love us, but he likes us. Look at this one, Luke 12, 32. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture right here. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. Now you got to unpack this because this is big. So Jesus says the father is bringing you the kingdom. He's going to save your soul. He's going to forgive your sins. He's going to redeem you. He's going to promise you heaven. God is doing all of this stuff. But understand first and foremost, it makes God happy to do it. God was actually in love with you and in like with you before he saved you. God chose you. Did you know that? God chose you because he likes you, doesn't just love you. Now, some of you have been taught the Bible and you've been taught about God by some folks who were maybe angry or they, they, they were all about kind of beating themselves up. And so they gave you the picture of a God who was kind of obligated to love you. God is not obligated to love you. God chose you. God likes you. And then God came in with the kingdom to show you his great love. Zephaniah 3.17 breaks it down even more. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. <laughs> Some of you guys have been blessed uh, to have your own child. And when you had your own child, maybe, maybe you were blessed with this portion of divine love that came over you. 
And when you, when you saw them, you instantly loved them. You instantly would do anything for them. You'd jump in front of a bus to save their life, yes? You would do all of those things, and you found yourself just looking at them while they slept and just loving them. And they hadn't done anything for you yet. You're like, some, some of you are like, you know, they still haven't done anything for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. Um, This, see, now you're amen and um, This is the kind of divine like and love of God that he's got for you. Um, he lives among you. This is the heart of God is to be around you. He's a mighty savior. He saved you and he'll take delight in you with gladness. When you walk in the room, God's eyes light up. Like that's, that's emotion, that's passion. With his love, he'll calm your fears. See, the, the, the New Testament says perfect love drives out fear. Did you know that? Amen. Because fear has to do with punishment. Jesus has carried your punishment. And so we are free in the will of God, in the presence of God. We, we're called to love and not to experience this fear. And then he'll rejoice over you with joyful songs. God sings lullabies over you. He sings songs of victory over you. That's how much he loves you. He's a God who doesn't just love us. He likes us. Luke 12, 7 says he knows the number of hairs on your head. What's that trying to say? It's trying to say, listen, God doesn't just know your name. God doesn't just know your social security number. He knows the number of hairs on your head. That's how individual his knowledge of you is because he loves you. It's communicating passion. It's communicating like, even in Luke 15 with the story of the prodigal son is one of our favorites, right? But the, the son rebels against the father in that story. And then God the father is the stand-in for the father in that story. And after the son rebels and the son decides to finally come back home and repent, and he's walking along the road. Do you remember where the father is? The father's on the porch waiting, and as soon as he sees rebellious son coming back home, he doesn't stand there and say, you need to think about what you've done. He runs to him. He runs to him because he can't wait for reconciliation. See, this is a father that doesn't just love. He likes us. Even when we're rebellious, sometimes when our kids rebel against us, we have a hard time liking them. And so you see how God the father comes in and he stands in as an example for us to be different, different. All right, let's look at what the Bible says about our human parenting. First verse is Psalm 127, verse three. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. So God gave you a human, amen? Some of you, God gave you multiple humans. You know what causes that, right? We won't get into that. Um, but God gave you a gift, in a human being to love and, and to protect and provide for and to raise in the way of Jesus Christ. And that this last part is where I'm going to focus most of it today is to raise them in the way of Jesus Christ. And I want to acknowledge quickly, some of you don't have young kids at home. Some of you are in a place of being a spiritual parent to spiritual children. A lot of these principles are going to apply. Some of you guys have physical kids or, 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 or maybe you've got foster kids or, or you've got um, uh, kids that you've adopted or, or, or extended family. Some of you guys got stepkids. There's, there's all kinds of different things that are going on, but they are gifts from God, amen? No matter what the structure. Uh, we set their path, train up a child in the way that they should go, Proverbs 22. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs is not trying to say, that if you take your children to Sunday school, they'll never reject Christ. That's not what that is saying. What it's saying is you have a great opportunity to set the course and to set the path of your children. That you have great influence over the kids in your life. And that's an amazing thing that, that as you have that influence as you set that path of Jesus in their life, you give them a great opportunity to stick with it for the rest of their life. 
Next, we teach God's way, verse 6, Deuteronomy 6.6. 6, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you are on the road. I love where it says, repeat them again and again to your children. How many times do you need to say the thing before it's obeyed? How many, time do you, how many times do we need to teach the thing before it's understood? Probably about the same number of times it took you, right? Amen. Right. Yeah. Over and over. Do you see God? Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Um, sometimes our parenting takes the wrong turn. These two verses are powerful. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up in the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. This one indicates that we can parent in a healthy way and in an unhealthy way, yes? Um, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. I'm offended that both of these start with fathers, by the way. It's just, it's your Bible, sorry. Uh, yeah, draw whatever conclusions you want from that. We can parent in a way, and we don't mean to, but we can parent in a way that, that actually makes our kids more and more angry, more and more embittered, more and more discouraged. If that's kind of a place that you've been with your kids, um, maybe lean in and listen a little bit extra today. Sometimes we break things as parents, me included. As we go along today, by the way, um, there's an opportunity, there's a real opportunity for you to take all of this teaching from scripture and you can take it and you can take it and internalize it as condemnation and judgment for your parenting as a reinforcement that you're a failure as a parent. Can I just call all that stuff out? And can I just say to you, I've been there, 100% been there. I lived years as a parent terrified that I was truly screwing up my kids. I mean, they were just gonna spend uh, decades in therapy after me. Because I, I was convinced I'd done everything wrong. Um, so I, I, I get it. I, I get the way that we beat ourselves up a bit. Can I just say that pathway is not healthy for you. It's a perfectionistic pathway. Yes. And, and as you go down that path, even though you don't mean to, what you do is you end up creating a connection between your kids' choices and your personal identity and value as a person. And as soon as you do that, you're going to find, not, again, not meaning to, you're going to find yourself parenting them in a direction for your own needs. Because you need to preserve you. Let go of that. Jesus is your identity. Amen. The fact that you are a son of God is your identity. Do your best with your kids, yes, to raise them in the way of Jesus, but don't give in to perfectionism. Here's a scenario. You walk into the hallway, and there's brother and there's sister, little, little ones, and, and brother has just hit sister, and sister is crying, and she's screaming, he hit me. And as a parent, what are you inclined to say? <laughs> Not what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe. Um, say you're sorry. Say you're sorry. Say you're sorry. Um, and then what does the little boy do? Sorry, glaring at her. Sorry, is he sorry? No. What has he learned? Nothing. He's learned next time, hit her when dad's not in the room. He's learned um, dad needs you to say meaningless words out loud and then dad will leave you alone and go away. Because we created an arbitrary rule here that has nothing to do with the heart. We bypassed the heart, ignored the heart, and you reap what you sow. What's the heart here? As a little person, you are in a spot where you had 
a little bit of frustration and you brought a little bit of violence to that little bit of frustration. And when you brought a little bit of violence, it felt good. And that someday is going to become bigger. And when it becomes bigger, real, real destruction starts to come in. So not only have we missed the heart, say you're sorry, but we needed to talk to the heart. We needed to have a real conversation about it, yes? Sometimes without meaning to, we're making ourselves, uh, instead of Jesus followers in our home, we're making um, very much smarter, more professional sinners in our home. Without meaning to. Another scenario, they're fighting over a toy. Um, and you walk in as the appointed referee of the situation, and, and what do you say? Um, what you say is, who had it first? As if pre-possession equals ownership, equals control, equals the heart of Jesus Christ for the world. It doesn't. Right? So, so who had it first? What does that actually communicate to them? There's a way to get control, just get there first. There's a way to get possession of whatever you want, just get there first. Where's generosity? Where's submitting your control to God who says you're not independent, you're not autonomous as a person, you're completely dependent on the Lord for all things. Give up control. Again, where's the, where's the heart of this thing? And have we missed the heart of this thing? I think we've missed the heart of this thing. Um, one of my kids, one time, we were, we were eating dinner, and, and we dared put green beans on the plates. And it became a showdown, you know what I mean? It, it, it was a big, big deal. One of my kids did not want to eat the green beans on their plate, and... I mean, I'm not trying to be impressive here. I think we might have had two of them, two green beans on the plate. And this, this child, um, after a lot of effort at the table, took the green beans into their mouth, maybe chewed them a little bit, but refused to swallow them. And it's, it's all of this stuff, right? It's this, it's this massive, massive conflict and we're like, we have to win this. And, and we're threatening, like, we're going to ice cream and you will not get ice cream. You will not get snacks. You will get nothing all night long unless you swallow the green beans. And Linda and I are looking at each other and we're like, they've already gone through the worst part. <laughs> like, they've tasted all of it. Like, texture everything. Like, we, like, it makes no sense. Like, if this was about flavor, like, it's not about flavor. It's not about taste buds. It's not about diets. It's about winning, <laughs> right? What this really goes back to, and, and I, I, I think, yeah, all night long, and I think even woke up with it the next morning, it's still in their mouth. Um, <laughs> which you're kind of impressed with, right? Like I was kind, kind of impressed. Um, anyway, what is, what's really going on here? What's really going on here is Adam and Eve who look up to Father God and say, you will not tell us what trees to eat from. We'll make our own decision. I'm king of my own castle, right? I, I, I've got my own destiny that I'm going to be in charge of. And so I will demand autonomy I will demand independence. I will choose what I eat. That's what was going on. Did we stop and, and, and explain to this child, like, this is what's going on in your heart? This is what's broken? No. We had this kind of ever ratcheting up battle of wills that went on all night, and I'll spare you the rest of the details. I'll spare me the rest of the details. Um, Here's sometimes uh, what we do. We carry around power tools without power with our kids. Um, at one point, 
um, I had some yard tools, right, like, like weed eaters and stuff like that, and, and they all went bad. And I look back on it now, and I'm like, I really don't think I ever did the whole, like, mix your oil with your gasoline, right? And I think I just basically destroyed them slowly. Um, and so anyway, I needed new ones. And when I needed new ones, because I wasn't able to ma manage all the mixtures and stuff, I just got battery operated, amen? I just got battery operated. The problem is, is that sometimes the batteries go out. And so now I'm working instead this whole thing of like a system of batteries and more batteries and I'll, I'll do some work and then bring them into the chargers and try to get these ones charged up so I can finish up the yard. Anyway, why do you care about any of this? Because if you've got power tools and they've got no power, they don't do anything for you. And sometimes we come to our kids with the power tools of fear and shame and anger. And they've got no power. They've got no power for good. Sometimes we come to them with arbitrary rules like say you're sorry. Sometimes we come to them with Old Testament style law. Like you broke my rule. Who had it first? Arbitrary, not getting at the heart. And we find that there's no power there. Anybody been there? Yep. And none of it, none of it works. And even if you break their will, green beans, even if you're able to break their will, have you won their heart? No. Uh, we don't win their hearts. We don't change their character. And the reason is, is because we're not parenting them like God the Father parents us. And that's what we're going to go back to. And it all leads to frustration. It all leads to hopelessness. It all, all leads to judgment of the parent because you don't feel like it's working. Ever feel like it's not working? I get it. And then it creates distance between us and them because some of those paths, some of those power tools that we try to go down, it actually creates distance between us and them. It doesn't bring our hearts together. And so if we're real, I think sometimes the reason that we find ourselves loving our kids, sure, I'll do anything for them, but I sure don't like them very much and I'm not super excited when they walk in the room. It has to do with these broken moments. It has to do with the fact that sometimes our strategies haven't worked and we feel condemned about it. What kind of parent should we be? An ambassador parent is what I'll tell you. Yeah. Pastor Tanner read this scripture last week. It's massive. 2 Corinthians 5.20. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. It's a really simple idea. God says, as a Christian, you're like an ambassador for a foreign country, right? Like you're supposed to take the message of the king. You don't change the mail along the way. You go and you deliver it to where it needs to go. That's a good ambassador. You represent, you pass the message forward. And so, of course, we understand this verse very clearly when it comes to evangelism and our friends and maybe even our family that we're like trying to help them understand Jesus, but this is a parenting verse. You need to take the gospel to your kids. And I'm not talking about Christian school. I'm not talking about Sunday school. I'm talking about the broken moments with them is where they need to see, not just hear, they need to see the gospel the most in the broken moments. Paul Tripp says it like this. And Paul Tripp, by the way, I've stolen some of my ideas from Paul Tripp today. I only steal the best ever for you because I love you so much. But he's written some great books on parenting and truly loves Jesus and, and, and pulls things from the gospel. So go and find his books. Um, he's even got some YouTube stuff out there that's really, really good. But here's what he says about it. He says, may we believe that the confrontations and comforts of the gospel are the best method for parenting. Your calling is to make the invisible presence, grace, power, and authority of God visible in the lives of your children you're the look on God's face. You're the tone of God's voice. You're the touch of his hand. He reaches through the vehicle of the parents that he has given to your kids. We teach the gospel to our kids every day, especially in these broken moments. How many of you feel super capable and successful at doing this? It's tough, isn't it? Um, we're going to walk through it, though. Um, I'll give you one more story about mine. 
Um, I'm doing pretty good at not naming the kids that I'm speaking about today because they're not here. So some of you are guessing. That's fine. Um, so one of our kids did really, really well, um, very, very truthful. It wasn't until they hit about sixth grade. When they hit sixth, sixth grade, I don't know if your kids have hit this spot yet, but the teachers start to do this thing where they don't necessarily send every single communication to mom and dad. They start tre treating that kid as if they're capable of managing themselves, which why would they ever do that? <laughs> but they do, and you see why they're doing it. They're trying to prepare them for junior high. They're trying to pre prepare them for high school, and on and on it goes. And so the teacher is just sending these assignments through my child back home, then they, they get to us, and, and we're saying, okay, well, how much homework do you have tonight? And the answer is, it's all done. It's all done. It's all done. This went on for months. And all of a sudden, we get the report back from the teacher much later saying, oh, by the way, I know their grades were here, but now they're way down here because there's all these assignments they just never turned in. And so not only are we frustrated about grades, frustrated about not doing schoolwork very well, but now we're, wait a second. Every time we said, do you have homework? You said no. And we let you go and play. We let you go and watch TV. Wait a second. You've been lying to our faces for this long? It's hard to face. I'm a better parent than that. Do you see the judgment? See the perfectionism coming in? It's not about you, mom and dad. It's not. Don't make it about you. So you can flip out. How dare you? You can be offended. You can take it personally. Or you can sit down and say, we're going to solve it all right now. You can be helicopter parent. We're going to fix everything right now. I'm going to go talk to the teacher. Right? Not make them face it. I'm going to solve it. Take it as an opportunity for you to love me better. I, I, I had a moment when this particular thing happened and, and um, God filled me with a vision for my child. And I do not want to mislead you. This did not happen often for me. But in this particular moment, this particular situation, God gave me a vision and I found myself talking with them and saying, you know what? It's not so much about the grades. It's not so much about the lies. It's about the dream. It's about the fact that when I dreamed of who you would be as an adult, you were an honest person. When I dreamed of who you would be someday, you were the kind of person that was so consistently truthful that your spouse knew they could trust you. That all the family around you knew that they could trust you in everything that you said and everything that you did, that you were a person of honor. Like, that's, how, that's what I dreamed of you. And that's what you're setting aside right now. That's what you're sacrificing right now. I want you to be this. And, and by speaking a dream instead of speaking condemnation, the conversation went a whole different way. Yes. And I feel like the more I reflected on why did this go a different way, it's because honestly, it's a little bit more the way that God parents me. So I'm going to see if I can explain that to you a little bit better. Not flipping out, but God giving us his vision for our hearts. Here's how I think we do this. And this is the broken moments. And I'm just going to, I'm going to give you steps on how to walk through a, a broken moment. Step number one, we're going to face our sin. Our sin. I don't say their sin. I say our sin because you've got to do both. And I'll explain that in a second. But this comes from Romans 3.23, for everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Some of you guys have heard that before. And this is a basis for the conversation. So I'm going to give you the scriptures that undergird this conversation, and then I'm going to walk you through the steps of it once you know the scriptural basis. So listen to both sides. The next step after facing the sin, is we got to speak love and forgiveness to them. Here's your two verses. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or forsake you, says God. Even as God convicts you of your sin, he is simultaneously promising you that he will never leave you no matter what. 
And it's the combination of those two things together that's massive for us. Because I can, take, I can take the rebuke of God as long as I know I'm loved. Next, if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So I get love and I get forgiveness. And then finally, I get to grow in God's heart. Grow in God's heart. And here's the scriptures. 2 Peter 1.8, the more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be. There's more to that verse, but I shortened it right there. God expects you to grow. God expects Jesus followers to follow Jesus. And it's not because he's a perfectionist and wants you to be also. It's because a good, healthy parent expects you to grow. Expects you to go further down the road with Jesus than you currently are. To stop expecting is to lower your hope. Lower your belief in them. Don't do that. Expect them to grow. And then Hebrews 12, 10, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. Now I've got to explain that one real quick. Yes. Consequence and punishment, discipline are good things. Yes, I just had a conversation with a family member. Um, actually, it was actually one of my kids uh, a few months ago. And I talked about sometimes God punishes us. And they're like, whoa, whoa, wait, dad. We go to Grace Fellowship Church. God's all about grace. Hold on. I thought Jesus paid. Jesus paid for all of our stuff. So we don't have any more punishments. I Hold on. There's a nuance there. Read the New Testament. Read it carefully. There's a difference between these two words, wrath and punishment. God's wrath is paid. God's wrath is about justice. It's about the scales of cosmic justice. And Jesus has paid for that. He has satisfied God's wrath. He has satisfied what you deserve or don't deserve. That's been satisfied. That's done. Amen. But discipline comes in and says, you know what? If there's no consequence here, you're not going to learn. If I don't allow the consequence to come to you, nothing will wake you up. And we need the stove to burn us when we touch it, don't we? Yep. And God, out of his love for us, notice it's always good for us so that we might share in his holiness, so that we might grow. Don't forget that. God allows consequences. Some verses come to your mind. Um, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Jesus. And that's true. But as God's causing everything to work together for the good of you, that does not mean he's removing consequence. Right. In some cases, the good of you is him keeping the consequence in there. Amen. And you're no different as a parent. Okay, let's, let's, let's walk through these steps. Face their sin. First thing you got to do is you got to slow down. This imagines a broken moment. This imagines a conversation between you and your child. Number one thing is you got to slow down. This is, this is one of the most important steps in the whole thing. Slow down. You have to because you're emotional and you need to chill out a little bit because you're going to need your heart intact. You're going to need to remember sometimes, come on, that you love them. You don't want to kill them, right? How long does it take? Depends on what happened, right? So slow down. Also, you got to remember that this is an eternal soul before you that Jesus died for, and you are not too busy for them. Amen. You've got to slow down, and you have to remember that. You have to get perspective for a second. But it's the thousandth time they've done this. doesn't matter. Slow down. Next, get them talking. What was in your heart when you did this? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. My kid will not be truthful at that point. They will not just suddenly confess, you're right, dad, I see the light. <laughs> but you still have to establish, this is part of our regular conversation. I want to know what was in your heart. I want to know what was going through your mind. I want to know how you see this situation. 
even if there's some lies that come in and there may be. Why? Because this is their heart we're trying to shepherd. And you've got to start there. You've also got to build within them that we have mutual respect, parent and child. You're worth listening to. Again, even if you're not being truthful with me. Next, speak the truth about what they've done. Say it out loud. Don't be so lenient with them that you hold back from them the truth. Say it. This is what you did. This is why we're having this conversation. Next, be a fellow sinner with them. (laughs) So I'm looking at my child who's done all this lying. Back in my day, I never would have done that. Hold on. Holy Spirit's like, hold on. Here's the truth about this kid's father. Every book report I ever did in grade school, I lied. I never read a single one of those books. I went to the library and I picked the one that hadn't been checked out in forever, looked at the table of contents, made myself up my own creative story, wrote the essay, turned it in, got an A+. Every time. (laughs) I was a raving lunatic liar. (laughs) How in the world am I looking at my kids saying, in my day, I never would. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And here's the thing. They don't need to hear that as pride. They need to hear a conversation about where that led me. They need to hear a conversation about when I didn't keep promises, when I didn't tell people the truth, here's where that started to lead. Even when I got away with things, there was deception at the heart of it because I started to tell myself that I could always get away with it and smarter teachers were headed for me. This doesn't work. You think a lie fixes a problem, lies don't fix problems. So have a conversation about that. Have a conversation about what truth does with trust. Have a conversation. Also, the reason that you're calling yourself a fellow sinner and you need to actually do that part is because as much as we're trying to parent like God, you're not the God in this picture. You're not their personal savior. You're the Christian. You're the Christian who's trying to help another Christian follow Jesus. So in no place here do you need to see yourself as the savior of your kids. You just aren't. Next, speak love and forgiveness. Speak love. There's an old hymn from the 1800s that says, Oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. Oh, love that will not let me go. That is the love of God. God looks at you and says, no matter what you've done and no matter what you do, I will never leave you. And you might say, well, our kids already know that. No, they don't. Every single time they fail, every single time they rebel, they need to hear those words from you. I'm not trying to give you law. I'm just trying to talk to you about the human heart. That human heart needs to know that they're secure. It's a secure love. And then they need to forgive or you need to forgive. And obviously, if in step one, they have not confessed their own sin, they're certainly not going to want to hear that you've forgiven them. That's real. Say it anyway. Because Jesus forgave me, I forgive you. Because when they finally are ready to face what they've done, they need to know where they stand with you. And I know that we don't forget sins like God the Father forgets sins, but as parents, we need to try. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you can somehow manipulate your own memory banks. I know that. But you can make a conscious decision to give them a clean slate. Try to give them a clean slate. Next, grow in God's heart. Give them that healthy consequence. Um, If you're still on the fence about consequences, let me just tell you this. Um... You will never escape authority structures in your life. Mom and dad are their authority now, and that relationship matters. But then they will have teachers that are their authority. And if they don't follow teachers, there will be consequences. If they don't follow coaches, there will be consequences. If they don't follow police officers, there will be consequences in their life. 
If they don't follow their future boss, there will be consequences in their life. Do you see how there's a relationship with authority they'll never get away from? Teach them how to deal with that well now. That's part of the reason they need those consequences. Otherwise, you're, you're saving them from something that they'll never really be saved from. Next, teach them the dream of Jesus' heart for them. Talk about Jesus' character. Talk about what's been broken here. Talk about how they can be different. Talk about what, what's the mountain that we're climbing? What are we aiming for? Why is it so important? Tell them all of those things. They need to hear that more than they need to hear condemnation about what they've done. And then sometimes, <clears throat> and this is just sometimes, maybe you need to choose mercy. And maybe you need to choose some kind of crazy grace over the situation. Amen. Sometimes. Yes. Sometimes you might need to decide to go and suffer with them. You ever go and sit in the time out with your kid? And say, if you don't get to have fun, I'm not going to have fun either. I'm not saying every time. But sometimes to show them. We had to say no ice cream tonight. I'm not going to have ice cream either. I'm going to sit with you in this. Why? Because Jesus did. Jesus didn't deserve the cross. He sat in the middle of your punishment and your suffering for you. Sometimes show them that. That could be a powerful moment. Um, two disclaimers on that list. We're almost there. That does not have to be a two-hour conversation. I know it's a big, long list. You can do all that, maybe three minutes. You'll be amazed at how quickly you can move through it. But do all the pieces. Um, does walking through this kind of thing with your kid, um, does it guarantee immediate measurable results in their behavior? Heck no. I don't promise anything. Why? Why? Because we all in this room, we take a long time to change, don't we? And the number of times that God has come and dealt with us, how, how long did it take before we started to show results in our character in our lives? Yeah. So don't expect that because I did it right, it's absolutely going to look like this. It won't. It may take time. It makes, may take space. You may talk about the dream of their character to them. Ten 20, 50 times before it actually starts to change. Have that kind of patient love with them the way that your father has with you. Okay. Last thing, 1 Peter 4, 8. Most of all, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other for love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. Why don't you guys stand? Let's just sit with the Lord for a second in our brokenness. We haven't parented the way that we wanted. Honestly, as I was putting this together, I'm like, God, Paul Tripp and Jesus, where, where were you guys 15 years ago so I would have done my parenting better? Amen. Really feeling that. A lot of conversations I would have done different. Love covers. Your kids have done things to you Love covers. Love is supposed to cover. Covers all the stuff. You're like, but we've been broken for so long. Yeah, let love cover. Love covers between you and God, doesn't it? Clean slate. Let love cover. Don't you want love to cover? Maybe you're going to bring things to God today about the <clears throat> brokenness in, in your parenting, the, the brokenness in your family Things aren't where you want them to be. Love covers. What a gift from Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we, we love, God, that you do forgive and that you forget. But, Lord, we remember everything, it seems. 
And because we remember everything, it feels like all the failures and all the rebellion and all the sins are right here in front of us right now. Lord, we need your help. We need your forgiveness, God. We need, we need your grace, God. We need a clean slate, God. We need the love of Jesus Christ to come and cover it all. God, I feel, pray for a blessing, God, in families today. I pray for a miracle in families today. God, I pray that there would be a fresh start and that you would teach us and that you would change us, God. We love you. In Christ's name.